Joshua Smith here, and welcome to the GSD Mode Podcast. Now get shit done and smash that subscribe button now. What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD Mode Podcast interview where every single week I interview top real estate professionals, top entrepreneurs, and straight up top badasses that are out there dominating their space. These are people choosing to not live a life of mediocrity, but instead to go out there and create big, amazing, epic lives for themselves, for their families, as well as have a big impact on others. And today, guys, we have another rock star guest here on the show. Our guest today, guys, is Rogers Healy, which is one of the most badass real estate agents in the game. So Rogers Healy, guys, is the host of Selling Mega Mansions, which is the top five real estate show on all of TV, has built a celebrity and pro athlete client base all over the world, Uh, named an NAR 30 under 30 finalist, was named the most influential leader in real estate by Luxury Home Magazine. And in addition to being one of the top 100 realtors year over year in the U.S., he also owns an amazing brokerage with hundreds of agents, has a property management company, and a global relocation company. Roger shares his journey and drops so much gold in this podcast interview. Now, real quick, before we jump in, if you haven't already, make sure to snag my new book at joshuasmithfreebook.com. These are a book filled with top tips, top strategies. It's called Dominate Your Real Estate Business top tips from a top producer and these are just top tips top strategies and tactics that i've learned over my 15 plus year long real estate career after becoming and continuing to be one of the top real estate agents and team leaders in the on the planet so make sure to snag your copy right now 100 free nothing being sold go to joshua smith freebook.com all right let's jump into this amazing podcast interview with rogers healy all right rogers my man welcome to the podcast my friend thanks for having me yeah, no, I'm so stoked and honored to have you on, dude. I mean, you're you're uh, an icon, a legend, you know, a, a goat in our industry, and uh, to be able to pick a, a brain like yours, man, I'm so excited for this. And you know, you. you've created this insanely successful real estate business um, in a lot of different facets and so forth throughout your career. And before we get into all the things that you're doing today, I'm always really intrigued in our guest journeys of of what led them here in the first place. Why in the clocks, man? How did this real estate journey get started in the first place? Uh, yeah. So, and, and thank you for the, the kind words. And I don't, I don't know if I agree with you, but I'll, I'll tell you, thank you. But yeah, m- my, my story is, uh, significantly different than, than most people. I, um, kind of, kind of what I've gotten used to saying, I'm 40 now. I got into real estate when I was 21. So I've done it for almost half my life. Um, but yeah, I was just kind of a lovable loser that had tried pretty much everything that, that interested me, um, from, you know, trying to be a sports agent, trying to be a broadcast guy. I moved to LA, tried to be an actor. And, you know, the common thread between all this was I either failed or I quit. And real estate was the first thing that, or really is the only thing that was left. Uh, but it was the first thing that I just dedicated, you know, to finding my way to find success. And again, to kind of play off the, the background story, I have taken the real estate exam more than anybody in the history of Texas. I, I passed it on my 22nd try where most people would be ashamed to, to share that, but that's just kind of part of my journey. And, you know, I, I just have learned a lot throughout it. So um, yeah, there, there's no glamor behind it. Uh, my dad is a life insurance salesman. My mom was a school teacher and I was a overweight frat guy that um, had no problem talking to people and real estate really was the only vehicle in the world of business that remotely was attract was a remotely attractive to me. And so, um, yeah, just, just kind of found, found my way through, through grit and baptism by fire. And then started my company, um, here in DFW called Rogers healing associates when I was 25 or 26 and, you know, still learning a lot every single day. But even that was, you know, I coincidentally put a post that yesterday on social media where, yesterday was our 14 year anniversary. And I was realizing as I was just talking um, that I never had a business plan, never had strategy. It was really just reactive. And I think a lot of that was due to the fact that, you know, when you're used to failing, the scariest, the scariest thought is succeeding. And that's still something for me to, to digest and to to deal with as being, you know, kind of successful. So yeah, um, not rags to riches per se, but lovable loser to remotely likable, successful guy, um, I think is a, a better way to, um, to prepare my memoir. 
Yeah, dude. Now, man, so I'm, I'm curious with, with failing the exam that many times, right? I mean, there must've been something about real estate that really attracted you that just allowed you to not give up. I mean, what was that? What kept you going? I mean, I've heard a lot of agents that, you know, it took their fifth time or seventh time to pass and so forth, but what kept you going? Honestly, man, the, the biggest thing is that I, I really didn't have any other options left. And I mean, I did, you know, I, I could have worked for my dad. I could have gone to, I could have gotten, gone to grad school if I would have gotten in, but it would have just been kind of delaying the inevitable. And so I, I didn't understand the value of, of hard work, but I didn't understand the value of persistence and of grit. And, you know, obviously the coincidence of your theme of your podcast, that that's just been the theme of my adult life is nothing replaces hard work. And for me, thematically, it was instilled in me unintentionally for the course of six months. I literally, sorry, I literally couldn't afford to take my real estate exam. So I got a job waiting tables to pay for my real estate exam. It was $68 times 21 times or 22 times that added up for, for me. But yeah, I just kind of learned the hard way. And then real estate, everyone has different missions within the world of real estate, right? And there's a few million people that do it in our country alone. And there's a few hundred that do it well. Uh, and I feel like part of my journey as a man, a man of faith and a, a business owner, business leader, whatever it is, was to show people that you can't just get into real estate and be a success, right? It, it just takes a lot of time. And um, yeah, it, it just kind of started, like I said at the beginning, where I, I just, I didn't believe it, but I didn't have any quit in me. And um, through that, I've just learned to kind of get through things that are way more important than real estate. Yep. Yep. Love it, dude. So then, I mean, we know the, the unfortunate failure stats that exist in this industry, you know, 90% drop out in the first three years and so forth. So you get your real yeah. estate license. Like what did you do those first couple of years? You mentioned you didn't have a business plan. You really didn't have strategy. Yeah. You know, it sounds like you just went out there and hustled your ass off, but what did those first yeah. couple of years look like that laid that foundation to allow you to really stay in the game and continue to grow and expand? Yeah, I mean, it's the same thing I do now. I, I have a sense of urgency and a sense of fear. And I think if you mesh that or if you couple that with a sense of humility, which took me a while to, to understand, it, it, I literally live every single day pretty much the same. And I am just very old school with my techniques. Um, not, I'm, I'm not a systems guy. I think it's going to be hard to find a, a type A salesperson, especially a dude that is you know, the most systematic uh, person ever, but I'm programmed, right? And you kind of remind me of that Jocko guy, the, um, you know, the ex-Navy SEAL that's just a fire-up guy. You've got that same aura, which I love. And, and that's, just, that's just how I operate as well. Um, but when I started, I, in, my, in my mind, I really thought I was the youngest realtor in Dallas. And I might have been. I was 21 years old. And, you know, everyone's story is different. But for me, I would go to these realtor events, right? Um, which I, I got personal thoughts on those and I would sit in a room and I'm like, Oh my God, it's all like my parents, friends, or it's people that are here just to get free donuts or it's people that literally have nothing else to do. I was like, this is ridiculous. And then I was like, Oh my God, this is my competition. And if I can go and outwork them and out strategize them, I'm going to take the deals that they're just expecting because they've had their license. And I went from being, like I said, lovable loser to relatively successful to like, oh, that's cute. You're doing well to a threat. And when you become a threat at, you know, 22, 23 years old, people look at you differently. And I had never experienced that either, which is kind of part of the journey on the other side of it. But I just started to grind and I would do things that other people didn't, didn't agree with. Right. And I hated people telling me, it's going to take time to make money. It's going to take time to be successful. Put in, the, it's like, yeah, it's going to take time, but why can't I make it right now? And, uh, but my big splash came with social media. Um, and, and, and again, maybe that's a question we can talk about later. But when I discovered that, I realized that we're in the game of self-promotion and no realtor on planet earth is, is cool. It's not a cool bit. It's not a cool business. And that's a hard pill to swallow, especially people that are just getting in the business that would rather post a selfie on a kitchen countertop and get 10,000 likes versus someone who would post a listing and get $10,000. But I had no problem doing it. And that, that's when I kind of became lethal, um, was coupling the hard work with the unabashed self-promotion um, angle. But before social media, I just did that by kind of being a, a used car salesman with sincerity. And my background waiting tables 
to be able to afford to take the real estate exam gave me that thicker skin and also the ability to read people pretty quick. And I think in this industry, you know, it's hard when someone reaches out and says, I want to buy a $10 million house and you ask for their proof of funds and their email address. And they say, give me a few days to get that email. It's like, you're, you're broke. Right. Um, but a background in the service industry gave me a different type of filtering system, which played to my favor very early on. Yeah. Yeah. I love that dude. And then, you Thanks. know, you said something that you operate from urgency, but also fear. Yeah. Right? Um, can you, can you go into that a little bit more? So, I mean, the, the urgency, but also I'm really intrigued by what you said with fear. Cause you, you look yeah. at a guy like you and the success that you've created. Now you're on TV shows and working with celebrities and it, you just, wouldn't strike me as a guy that is afraid or operates from fear. I think being afraid and having fear are two different things. And I, I think that maybe for me, I'm an anxious person by trade and that is not, I mean, it's real estate has only made it worse, but that's just kind of how I operate. But having a sense of urgency is something most people have an extreme lack of. And let me, let me kind of, I'll just, I'll just kind of tell you how I, how I think. Everybody, in my opinion, especially a city like Phoenix, Dallas, Miami, New York City, Chicago, L.A., Houston, Atlanta, Charlotte, all the top cities in the country, they all know at least five realtors, okay? Uh, and one of the first things that I learned or that I was taught when I got into the industry was if you go to meet a prospective buyer, the only way to guarantee they're going to be your client is they sign a representation agreement. Okay, great, done. So the sense of fear is, hi, I'm Rogers. I need you to sign this document before we walk into the next property. Most realtors don't do that, right? So my, my question, even now with prospective buyers is, do you have a representation agreement signed? No, great, it's a prospect, I'll get them signed. The realtor's pissed that didn't get the deal. So I live like that. And so for me, my evolution to being like an entrepreneur that just happens to be in real estate, I own a real estate company, great. But I own a property management company, I own a development company, and I own a, prop, uh, a relocation company. Because over time, my people I thought were going to be loyal to me would, be, would go meet a mover. And the mover would say, oh, my best friend's a realtor that will give you a better deal. Use him. And then they would go work with a property management company. And the property manager would also have their license and say, hey, I'll give you a better deal. So I was like, screw it. I'll start a property management company. I'll start a relocation company. And that way, everything is under you know, my umbrella to where it's mine to lose, which was a lot more work. But it gave me the... the not control, but gave me the ability to screw up. And if I screwed up and lost them, then I, then I deserve to. But the sense of fear and urgency is lacking in real estate. In real estate, and we do commercial real estate too, but um, it, it's just there's, there's people that just expect it to happen. And when you have nothing to lose and when you need to make money um, and if picking up the phone and asking for help is going to lead you there, then do it. But my thing, too, is the worst phone call ever is you call someone on a Friday because you want to go play golf on a Thursday. And I don't play golf. And they tell you, oh, my God, I wish you would have called me yesterday. What? We actually just hired. Like, Ugh. And if you have that happen to you enough, you just live like, who's, who, who else am I forgetting about? And you kind of put this superhero costume on that plays to your favor. And like anything, you know, you program yourself to work out. Then you work out. If you miss a workout, you feel, you feel bad. I live every single day like that to where leading by example with our brokerage here, I think people appreciate it to where I'm not a, I'm not a hoorah fire up guy. I'm actually a, I'm a producing broker and I, and I live it, which just attracts the right kind of personality to come work in our companies. Yeah. Love that dude. So then, you know, I'm curious with, you started your, your real estate company in 2006. Yeah. And man, the market was, was really good 2005, 2006, but then it, it shifted. And obviously we've just recently went through or are still going through COVID-19 and, you know, some other market disruptions and so forth. You know what I'm curious, man, it, 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 a lot of agents, especially in the great recession and, and Dallas was hit hot, hit, you know, market that was hit hard. Same with here in Phoenix, you know, what are some of the things that you do and have done over the years whether it was the great recession or whether it's COVID-19 and so forth to be able to adapt and be able to shift and pivot your business to not just survive, but to continue to thrive during those times. Yeah. And I, I do think survival is part of it too. And, and, and as an entrepreneur, everybody that's in real estate is an entrepreneur. Okay. Whether they own the company or not, you're an entrepreneur. And I think that you become 
success with different things as you grow in business and you grow your business. And I found I, I would start these companies a lot off, off of ego and a lot off of creating conveniences. But eventually my obsession came with not starting the business. It was making sure it didn't fail. And so, yeah, like you said, I started my company. I was 25, 26 and ego was bigger than the state of Texas. And then all of a sudden, you know, the bottom dropped out. So I had to learn how to adjust quickly. And I think that's the joy of being a, a small business owner is that being agile is, 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 is mandatory. And so I kind of developed different ways of thinking. And like I, my, my saying goes, everyone needs a place to live. A lot of people need a place to work and some people want a place to go on the weekends and all those people need a realtor. So um, my, my, my splash in real estate when I started was doing apartment leasing, right? Which is, um, probably the least glamorous form of real estate because it's just burn and turn selling cars, waiting tables, getting a 20% tip, but you can make 800 to three grand a pop. So I went back to basics and you know, my overhead at that time for being the owner was probably 2,500 bucks a month, which was a ton of money for me. Um, so I just, I just thought very meanly and I are very basically and got back into that um, lost agents because of it. But you know, you, you bet on yourself, you're going to win. And for me, when everything started happening like that, I just started getting back into the grind. And so that's why when COVID hit, and I've got all sorts of thoughts on that, I think that's why they bring me on TV is I'm just very raw. And I don't sugarcoat things. But I don't think we've been through a recession yet. Like one month off, that's a break, right? But a recession is what happened to us 11, 12 years ago when it sucked. And when you go through something like that, and you survive, you know that you're great where you kind of long for those difficult situations. So yeah, short answer for me is I just, I, I, I grinded, I worked hard. The Dallas Realtor Network went from about 20,000, 25,000 to about 15,000 over the course of two months. I stuck with it. Market gets great again. Those 10,000 that dropped off the Delta, they came back and they lost the momentum and all the people they thought were gonna wait for them, you know, came to people like me and, and it was just a really, it was a fun lesson to learn. Yep. Awesome, dude. So then, you, you know, you mentioned earlier social media, and that seemed to be a really big turning point, which I can't remember exactly, but it seemed like, what, 2009, 2010, that social media became, you know. Uh, for me, it was like 2000, I was uh, 2005. Oh, I, really? Yeah, so Facebook, um, and, and it really was controversial when our, maybe it's controversial when I got on it. When, when Facebook first launched, it was launched for college students and you had to have a college email address to have access. So I saw this and I was like, crap. So I, I, I reached out to SMU where I went to school and I asked for an alumni email address and they gave me one, but it ended with smu.edu. So I got on Facebook and I just started adding, adding these college kids. And I was like, this is unbelievable, right? And everyone gave me so much crap from it. But that was my down payment for my first house at 24 was doing leasing for sorority and fraternity and football players. Um, so yeah, that was, that was really, you know, that was a, a big leverage point for me. And I, I don't know if, uh, if I cut you off on your question, but I just saw the value of that. And um, a mistake I made, one of the mistakes I made at the beginning is, you know, when you think of like a realtor, you, you and I are probably within five to 10 years of each other's age. So you're anywhere between probably 30 and 40. Um, and as a kid, you think of a realtor, you think of like, oh, here's a picture of a lady or a guy in front of a house and a postcard. And here is the newspaper that you open up, or here is the phone book. I didn't have money to do that. And I thought it was cheesy. Uh, and I think also with that kind of stuff, it's hard to measure your results. I didn't realize that was a great thing to do as well. But a mistake I made is I went heavy up to where I was all social media. And then I had something go viral um, before social media. And I just didn't go and actually try to grow both at the same time. Um, but yeah, social media, even now still, I would probably say as a company, 80% of our business, 80% of our revenue comes from Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, and Facebook, a little bit of YouTube as well. And it, it's all, obviously, it's only going to continue to perpetuate with stuff like this. Yeah. So how, how are you guys, can you walk us through what you're doing on these different platforms to generate so much business? Um, yeah. Okay. So Again, like I said, my background is not strategy. Uh, I'm a, I think I'm a very observant person. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a selfishly observant person. If there's something that's going to benefit the company or me financially, I'm going to probably try to know it better than anybody. And I think that I can study habits and audiences and trends better than just about anybody because I'm on my phone for probably 14 to 16 hours a day, truly, or a computer. 
So you just kind of, you kind of start to learn this stuff. So the first thing I'll tell you is all of our marketing is personality based. And like people like you and me, no one ever said those guys are subtle and they just blend in. It's like, no, you're, 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 you're boastful, you're proud and you, you want to be to where there's no mystery to you, which I think is a, is an element of being a successful salesperson. So for us, everything is personality based where we have a few hundred people that work here in, in North Texas for us that are marketable, that are fun people that have a big smile that are you know not afraid to put themselves out there. And we do that. And that comes with a lot of chatter, right? Your podcast is GSD, which we know what the S stands for, which means people are talking great. Right. So, so we want that. And the thing that we do that is rare is we back it up with knowledge as well. And when I can go train agents better than any agents in the country, at least the state of Texas, and they get opportunity, they can close it, right? And I, I just get angry looking online, especially Instagram with these people that the saying goes, you're not mayor in your own hometown. They don't know what the hell they're doing. And, and they literally are in and out of real estate, which is why you said 90% quit within the first three years, 80% in Texas quit within their first three months. And it's because of that. So, you know, we, we hyper train, but we also encourage over communication. And I think with social media, there's all sorts of metrics people can go and study and read and, you know, X, Y, Z. But to me, over posting is crucial because you never know. And if I'm going to go fishing and someone says, I can give you one fishing pole with, with one lure, or I can give you five fishing poles with unlimited lures, I'm going to take them. I'm, I want more lures. And that's what we do is we just, we fish all day. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's a different it's a different acquired taste for us, but the goal is to be unavoidable. And when, you know, people from Phoenix or North Te or South Texas start to recognize us, we know that it's growing. Um, and that, that to me is, is part of the mission. Yeah. So what, what do you think are, are some of the, you know, mistakes, if you will, that, that when you're seeing other real estate agents, not leveraging social media, well, I mean, you mentioned posting a lot, you know, right. Um, but yeah. I mean, you know, the, I see the typical thing over and over. Oh, just listed, just sold. If you're thinking about buying or selling, you know, but I mean, you've done such a brilliant job at getting people to, to know you. I mean, you've become really a celebrity in, in, in your space. Oh, thanks. So, I mean, what, what do you see, what are you guys doing differently when it comes to that? Or, and or what are the mistakes that you think that most, I mean, we have real estate agents from all over listening to this podcast that yeah. I mean, social media is free. You know, right? Like, what, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you, you see that your non-teammates are out there doing? Well, I mean, my teammates make mistakes. I make mistakes too, right? It, 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 social media is a drug, period. It, it, it's a drug. And I don't care what anyone says. It, it is, it's, a, it's like dopamine when someone gives you a like, you know? And it, it's a confidence boost, especially now where, like, you're in isolation. You might not be alone, but you're not around people and posting something and someone saying that's awesome congratulations i'm proud of you like it's it's a feel good but you know maybe this is a another interview where it's just rogers it, rogers raging about realtors online the number my number one like complaint is that they don't smile like like smile right and if you think about the, what we do in real estate the least important thing that we're selling is the home is the condo, is the townhouse, is the land, it's the building. You're selling yourself. And if I want to go and I want to hire somebody to work for me, if I want to hire somebody to represent me, I want to look at their eyes and I want to look at their mouth and I want to see if they're happy. And if they look like they're angry, then they're not in it for the relationship, right? And there's a reason that our industry, my very first job ever was working at Blockbuster Video. I was a video game consultant. Blockbuster Video is dead because of Netflix, right? A lot of people had travel agents and travel agents in their family. That industry is dead because of travelocity, but there's a reason that realtors are still around. It's because it's a relationship business. And so the thing that we're working on right now to answer 95 questions at once is we're trying to add dimension to our marketing, right? Whether that means videos, whether that means interviews, podcasts, et cetera, to where it's hard to go and really just sell yourself by smiling with a headshot, but it's better than nothing. So my number one problem with that is that people really, unfortunately now, especially millennials, and I hate to call them out, but it really is millennials, they really overplay the feel good of a like versus the feel great of a closed deal. And a lot of times you'll see agents post these new listings, but there's a reason you're not seeing them say just sold. It's because they don't know what the hell they're doing. So um, personality 
uh, goes a really long way. And I think heart goes a lot, a, a lot further. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of frustrations for me, but it's the consistency factor. And like you said, the problem, I'm getting married in a few weeks to um, the greatest woman ever who is not, um, she's very private, right? And, and when we first started dating and we were first together, her, and her Instagram is still a private account. And every time before she accepts someone, she's like, do you know them? I'm like, no, she's like, okay. It's like with me, it's like, I want them, right? To where I want to welcome people in my life. But even that is an art form where like, I, I, you just kind of, I find myself questioning myself, should I post a picture of my dinner? Do people really care about this song I'm listening to? But I do that because if not, I'm just a one trick pony with real estate, right? And, and the last thing I'll say is if you've done it long enough, you've done it for, you know, 15 years, I've done it for, uh, you know, around that time too. When you're out with your family, when you're out in public, when you're out with your friend, the last thing you want to talk about is real estate. So I have to go and drop these little nuggets subliminally to where if someone knows me, they know that I love multiple things. And one of those things is my faith. Another is my family. Another are my dogs. And another is music. And I would way rather talk about those things after hours than real estate, right? Um, so it's, it's just like, it, it's, it's a nonstop game that you have to continue to play. And if you stop, you get squashed by the next person. Um, so yeah, it's, it's inviting people into your life um, to a point. And again, I've made mistakes to where I've overshared, I've overposted, and I've annoyed, you know, people that love me. Um, but I just, you know, I'm, I'm programmed. Um, but with all that being said, social media at the end of the day is a vehicle for sharing your life with people that you love. Um, but unfortunately, in real estate, there's a lot of people that maybe you don't know, you don't love, and they might not like you or love you. And that comes with it as well. Uh, but that's, that's sales. That's getting thick skin and that's dealing with it. And that's why, you know, we make the big bucks. Yep. Yep. Love it. Well, and congrats, man, on, on the yeah. up and coming uh, a wedding here in a couple of weeks. That's awesome. Thank man. you. Thanks, man. Um, so I, you know, I'm curious at what point in your career, cause you, you mentioned earlier, and I love it. <clears throat> I mean, the hard work, the hustle, the commitment, and you start off with apartment leasing and then you talk about the market adjusting, having to go back to that. And, yeah. you know, and, and now, I mean, you, you work with, these celebrities and athletes and man, you're on a, a you know, TV show selling mega mansions, you know, mm -hmm. at, at what point did that start to pivot and transition where you started to get more in that niche? Well, we still do apartment leasing and, you know, we still do entry level sales. We still do first time office leases. We still do condo sales. We do everything that, you know, I, I, I've grown with my audience. And when you get into a business, when you're 21 years old and if you treat people right, they're going to keep coming back. And so that's, that's part of it. But for me, you know, kind of my theme among other things is just to like go for it and, and try and you never know. So with television, you know, I, I kind of mentioned that my goal at, you know, from like ages 12, right when I could appreciate John Cusack and Adam Sandler till age 20, 21, I wanted to be an actor. I wanted to be in, in romantic comedies and here I am selling real estate, but I still had that you know, that, that, that bug in the back of your head that you just can't shake. So I was like, how can I go do that with real estate? Right. So I started tweeting at news channels and, um, about a decade ago, um, I was, I started to become the, the real estate guy for Fox and then CNBC called and then, you know, other people started calling and then I did million dollar listing and then all these people. Um, and then I finally, not finally, sorry then I was uh, able to be blessed with hosting my first show, um, which, which you mentioned. And, you know, it, it just kind of grew with me to where I'm kind of like real estate's Olsen twin. And you just like, you, you watched them grow up. Unfortunately for them, they kind of went, Burr. and I, you know, and, and still staying remotely humble with it, but it, it, it's fun. And then I had to find ways, sorry. Um, I had to find ways to keep it interesting for me and in real estate. Once you've done it long enough and once you've sold, 5,000 homes like you or a hundred homes, like some other people, like they kind of all become the same. So how do you go and keep it interesting to where, um, like my, my worldly obsession is music. It's music. And, and, and I could talk about music all day long. I could, you know, I'm sitting here in my little nook at my house and I have a Woodstock poster an Eagles poster and a temptations poster, just cause it keeps me uh, distracted from just working. But the thing about concerts, right? Like uh, the Eagles are my favorite band of all time. And the first time I saw them play, they played two nights in a row in Dallas. And the first night I went, I was like, this is the most incredible moment of my entire life. They're 
you know, their communication is great, their outfits are great, and everything was awesome. I went the next night, it was the same cadence, the same outfit, and literally the same conversation. I was like, oh my God, that's what I'm doing. It's just literally like plug and play every single day. So the shift has been, if I'm gonna do real estate, I wanna at least do it with people, like I was saying earlier, that we can talk about music, we can talk about sports, we can talk about business, politics, to where really nobody's hiring me. I mean, look at me, I don't look, I had a mustache until Monday. I don't look like a typical realtor, but I can talk to you about things that are interesting. And so I just had that mentality. And at the beginning of my career, I would do things like, I would go to the Dallas Mavericks office once a week for four years in a row and drop off crap, koozies, pens, cups, like just, stuff that they're probably going to throw away, but they kept seeing me and they eventually gave me my first opportunity back in like 06 and it changed my, my career. Um, and I, I just really had to do that to where, you know, it, it, I, the, the day-to-day realtor hustle for me, I didn't enjoy it. But if I'm on the phone with the Kardashians or if I'm on the phone with a local athlete or a fortune 50 CEO, that's fun. That's really, really fun. Um, so yeah, I just kind of grew with my clients, but I, I have to keep it, I have to be humble with it because the people that work with me and for me, maybe they don't want to do that or maybe they don't have those opportunities. And that's why my strategy with leading the companies and even online is I'm, you know, it's, it's all by design. Um, and I think that attracts everybody because the problem with branding yourself as like a luxury agent is people define luxury differently right? People in Phoenix, people in Beverly Hills, people in Dallas might think luxury is 2 million or higher, right? It could be $200,000 or higher in Oklahoma City. You want to help those people too, because you got, you got money on the table. So yeah, it, it's been a, um, it's been a lot of intention. It's been a lot of humility. Um, but with all that being said, the people that we have represented, like my childhood heroes are literally my clients. And that to me, it, it's just fun and finding a way to tie things in that, you're like, why did I go through this journey of a failed actor? Why did I go through this journey of a failed sports broadcaster? And all of a sudden you're like, Deion Sanders is my client. Are you kidding me? Or we did a deal for the rock. Are you, it's like, that's fun. And it just keeps me young. And I think that there's a reason that I probably don't look or act 40 years old. It's because I'm still like a child in my head with what I do during the day. And now I have legitimate access to these people that I've, you know, I've grown up kind of obsessing over and that to me is a different kind of game as well that um, I never want to win because then I would have to find a new way to stay um, entertained in, in the world of real estate. Yeah, no, that's awesome, man. So then, you know, for those that have been in the business for a long time, you know, cause I mean, burnout happens and, you know, and it sounds like from what you just got done saying that you've used that almost as a sign to, for growth and, and yeah, you know, take that to the next level. Is that the, is that really what you found to be the key for somebody that's listening that maybe is feeling in that rut, feeling burnout. That's just a sign that dude, you gotta, you gotta, it's time to level up and take it to the next level of growth. Or take a break. Right. Um, something weird. Are, are you a big sports fan? No. Okay. I, I mean, I am and, I, and I'm not, but something I've, I've started to ask people, let's say that you like football, right. And you're in Phoenix and like, well, you don't like football because you're in Cardinals territory. <laughs> so you guys are like, Oh, and a thousand, even though we have some clients on the, on the Cardinals. So hello to those guys. Um, I used to be obsessed every single year with being the number one realtor in Dallas and the country in the, in Dallas and the, in Texas and in the country. And I knew that if my numbers were between 60 and a hundred million dollars, I could be in, I could be mentioned with those people. Right. And then I look back and like three years ago, four years ago, could you tell me who won the Super Bowl? You're like, yeah, maybe the Patriots, maybe, right? It's like, maybe. People forget. And so I had to reach a point where I had like kind of a a breakdown um, three or four years ago because I was just like, oh my God, I've literally done the same damn thing every day for 16 years. I, and I was just like, what am I, for what? Like to make money, to have a nice house. It's like, it's not worth it. And so I've had to be as intentional with like little things like tricks. Like I don't check my email after 10 o'clock at night, which is like ridiculous. Or every day when things were normal, I have a room at my house that's a music room. And I would go in there at six o'clock on the dot, literally, and listen to three records on vinyl. And it would just turn me off of of, of work to where I'm like, it's okay if the deal doesn't work. It's okay if that person wants to quit. 
it's okay if they hire somebody else. And I think burnout comes with the obsession of success. But what I've seen too, is if you look in your nut, in your market, in Scottsdale and Highland Park in you know, Manhattan, whatever it is, and you look at the top five or 10 realtors, probably at least half of them are not happy people. And that's because they married real estate. And if you go to your Instagram, your first photo is you lifting weights. The second photo is you with your family, right? Like you're not defined by real estate and neither am I. And I think that's a really hard thing to do. But when you do that, you realize like it's just work, right? It's a career. It's not a hobby, but it's just work. And the burnout, the resentment, et cetera, that does come when you don't take a break. Um, but I can't tell you how many trips in my 20s and my 30s that I literally canceled the day off because of like a showing, right? And if I look back and I could have gone with my friends on a, on a cool trip and taken those photos versus like make $5,000, it, it, like, it wouldn't have changed my, it's, it has not changed my life and I regret it. Um, but I had to learn that the hard way. Yeah. Yeah, love it, dude. Now, I mean, today you got you talked earlier about you know you've got the the real estate brokerage, you've got the moving company, you've got these all these other you know uh, uh, facets of the business. For those that are wanting to start other facets of the business, other concierge services or whatever it may be, you know, what what were some of the biggest challenges and learning lessons that you had to go through as you were creating these different legs? Um, yeah, how much? How, yeah. Uh, they, they still are challenges. I, I, I literally, I was 25 or 26 years old, which is not young, but it's also not like seasoned when I started a real estate company, right? And I didn't really realize that every realtor that I hired was a liability, which means sometimes liabilities lead to lawsuits, right? Um, and I unfortunately am familiar with that kind of stuff now, but also other companies too, it's more exposure, it's more liability, and it's also less time to focus on, on one thing, if I, if I wouldn't have been the age when I started my other companies, I probably never would have done them. Um, I'm glad that I did, you know, but I, I, I'm still learning. And I'm still growing. But the short of it is I, I feel like the best way to make money in the world of business is to create a, to create a convenience. And that's what I became. I became a, con, a convenience broker. Um, I never have once proclaimed that I love being a realtor, right? And, but I love, I love problem solving. And I love going and observing things to where if I see somebody in a world that I know well enough and they're not, and they're the best at their field and they're not doing as best as better than I could be doing. I'm going to start a company and I'm going to try to go and beat them. And, and I did that throughout, you know, like I said, very selective and obsessive observation. Um, but because of that, it took away from the ability to stabilize my real estate company first, where that really didn't come till a few years ago. And here we are on, on year 14, but, the short of it is I would put structure in place and I would also be willing and be wanting to pay people what they're worth. And I, the idea of paying somebody back in the day, a healthy salary, I was like, oh, no way. I don't need to do that. And I kept having turnover. Right. And then all the things you hear about like hiring your friends, don't do it. Ah, it's my best friend. Like, don't do it. Right. Um, about having people just like work from home before the COVID thing, they'll be, don't do it. And so I, you know, I had to learn these lessons the hard, the hard way, which made me a stronger leader over time. But um, yeah, I think that gut instinct is, is crucial uh, in life and in business. And the times I'm like, I don't know, I'll try it anyway. It always blew up in my face. Um, but I wish I would have been structured. I wish I would have learned how to ask people for help earlier on. And I wish I would have had advisors. Um, I literally, up until recent, tried to do every single thing on my own and finally folded a few years ago after just a breakdown and got people involved that only wanted to help me out because of that. And it changed my life and it prepared me for, for Abby, who I'm hopefully marrying here in a little bit. Yeah, that's awesome, man. So then, you know, when it comes to finding, because there's so many of, of the greats and even, you know, even if we go back to a classic, we can grow rich with Napoleon Hill and, you know, talking about the importance of these advisors, you know, board members, you know, and so forth. When, when you're, what, how do you want to frame and, and call them advisors, mentors, and so forth? What have you found to be like really important in the key to finding the right advisor? Cause it can be tough when you have, I mean, I've made the mistake of having too many advisors and too many kind of yeah. whispers in my ear. Yeah. Um, I, I, one of the reasons I think I was successful early on is 
I didn't have a mentor in real estate. And more importantly, I didn't ever have someone pull me aside and say, Hey, I want to, I want to help you. And good and the bad is again, I had something to prove being a business owner is different. And like I said, I mean, obviously realtors and independent contractors, you're your own boss, but you maybe don't own your own business technically. But when I did that, when I became intentional about finding like a mentor or an advisor, I, I just kind of started asking around and there was this one guy that my dad, who's a business owner, my dad's my best friend, but we're very different personalities. Like he is regimented. He is, he's so smart. He reads books and he, he's just a machine. And I'm obviously a spastic, a spastic, you know, nut job. But there was just one guy he kept mentioning. He's like, you need to call Jerry. You need to call Jerry. And in my head, I was like, ah, if I call him, I'm going to have to admit fault. I'm going to have to break down. And then literally the first day I met him, I just lost it. And that night I drove to Colorado in the middle of the night with my dog and had, um, had a fun little breakdown. Cause I realized that I was in, I was in a world of, of, of kind of trouble that I needed to fix. But I think, you know, there's a book, I'm not a book reader, first of all, I wish I was, but there is a book called the power of who, and a friend of mine here named Bob Odeen wrote it. And the premise of the book is that no matter where you are in your life, no matter where you are in your sales career, you already know the most important people that you need to know. Right. And it's really, it's like your, it's your five people that are going to be your biggest cheerleaders, your walking foot soldiers, the ones that are going to go to war with you, et cetera. And I just kind of reevaluated my life. I'm like, who are my five people? Right. And through those people, I could just call them and they're going to answer. And I'm just going to say, Hey, who do you know? Right. And the way you talk to people and said, do you know anyone who do you, it's like, who do you know that could help me out? Right. And through that, it just led me to a different kind of, of, of mentoring. But on top of that as well, last thing I'll say, cause I know I'm, I'm talking a lot is I found too, that some people, like if you were in high school and you just know that, nerdy dorky guy that had the attractive date to prom you're like how did that happen right it's because everyone assumed that that attractive person already had a date and so i went and i would go i, I never started at the bottom with my list of unicorns or elephants i would always start at the top and i would get a hold of these people and be like hey i want your help and i'm like i'm sure you get a thousand calls and they're like i actually have never gotten a call like this and so these people that were part of my journey and that had like a flower in my float in my early 20s like they're billionaires or they're owners of big companies or they're influential people where they just wanted to help. And the common thread with all of them was they said this thing to me is you remind me of how I was when I was your age, except you have a little bit more ignorance. Right. And so I leveraged that, but I always found a way that these people that would help me for free, I never let them do it for free. And I never would like write them a check, but I, I made sure that they felt special. And I became obsessed early on with the golden goose golden egg approach. And whenever somebody produced something for me, I always let it back to them. Um, so yeah, I have a lot of mentors in my life. I have one true advisor that has proved to be one of the great, best decisions I've ever made. But I feel like with a company, we have a few hundred people ranging from 18 years old to 75 that work for me. Those are my mentors as well. And I think that um, keeping it comfortable like that um, just creates a really cool and safe office environment. Yeah. Love it, dude. What, what do you do to stay humble, man? Cause you've, you know, you've won so many awards, you've created so much success, but at the same time, man, you're just so down to earth and humble. Like what, what do you do uh, to, to, I guess, make sure that, to not let that, you know, and you talked earlier about ego being the, the size of Texas, you know, like what, what do you do to stay humble? Um, well, I'm trying to think the best way to answer this in life, like you can place different products in your life that are, I'm strategic with the people I surround myself with. Right. And I have, I have friends that are wildly successful, but we have a common theme of being Christians and, and, and having the same belief system where it doesn't matter how great you are on this earth. There's only one thing that matters. And I think having that as, you know, just the common bond just keeps it really comfortable. And also, when you grow, when you're friends with people, when you're 20, when you're 30, et cetera, they don't give a crap if you're making money and you're successful. They care how you are. And I think that's, that's important. Um, but also, you know, I, the beauty of being a legit, I was never a loser, but I was always a failure. And I remember what that, what that was like. And sometimes I'll literally just sit there and start dying laughing. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, this is hilarious. But I feel like part of my mission is I don't want 
people that have something to prove and that have a background of just being said no, those are the kind of people you want to invest in. Because the minute they get their first yes and they get that confidence, their, their life could change. And what you do with, with somebody and how you help them when their life changes is how they impact the world. That's a mission. And, and, and so I have to just go in and, and be around those types of people. And, and really, all that I've done, literally, there's, like, there's nothing that I've done that's special. It's just that I've worked hard and, I, and I've learned stuff and I've, and I've, and I've gone for, I've gone for broke a thousand times over and sometimes it works. Um, but again, like I said too, I'm a realtor and I get awards for being a realtor. And that to me, it's not like I'm getting an Academy Award or an Oscar, I mean, or a Grammy or Nobel Peace Prize. Like, congratulations, you literally open doors for a living and you talk to humans and you fill in blank contracts. Great. Um, so the thing that I'm most proud of is the office culture awards and the people that are just happy to be a part of my company. And then we're also getting stuff for, um, you know, fastest growing companies and that's based on revenue, which is really cool. But yeah, it, you know, um, I have a lot of ways I trick my minds, uh, or my mind, my multiple personalities, but I have a lot of ways to do it. But, um, at the end of the day, you know, having dogs is also really helpful because they don't care. And we have three. And, um, yeah, it's just funny, but I think leading by example and making fun of myself and being self-deprecating eliminates the idea of other people making fun of me first. And, um, it just keeps it simple. It, it still comes with, with crap. It's bizarre. You know, like it, it, it you, you, I hesitate posting something online about like, Hey, I got this award today. Right. And people are like, congratulations. And someone's like, why do you have to always put like, ah, can't win. So, yeah. um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a balancing act. And I know that I've been put in this position to help people and to speak my mind and to let them know that like, hey, just because you're successful and you're making money doesn't mean you have to change. And real estate ruins people. It ruins them, but it also, it also can change people for the better. And I just want to be uh, an example of that. Yeah, love it, dude. So then, you know, you spoke earlier about, uh, or just a moment ago about culture and you know, word gets thrown around a lot today. People talk about it, but you know, very few people, I think, take it serious and know what it takes to create an amazing yeah. culture in a company like you've created. What What are some of the big keys? You know, for let's just say a team leader, a broker, owner that's listening to this, that they're wanting to enhance their culture and create some, you know, an amazing culture, an amazing company like you have. Yeah. Um, so real estate. And again, like you and I can both speak to it because we've done it, we've had success and we get it. But if y'all have done it or if you've not done it, when you go out into the field, whether it's literally into, into a field to sell a field or just to a house, it's a war zone, period. And there is somebody there with one of their objectives being to beat you, okay? And even if you successfully close a deal, at the end of the day, somebody probably won. That's negotiations. An office needs to be a safe place. An office needs to be a place where people can come and feel comfortable and they can feel at home. And for me, creating that and keeping that up is crucial. And it's almost like they come back to recharge. And especially now, like we're having literally meetings over Zoom. I had 17 Zoom meetings yesterday, right? And I have never appreciated a cushion more in my life because I'm experiencing different kinds of feelings in my bum than I ever have before. And I'm already a fidgety guy. But we want people to feel safe and connected. And I think doing that, gives them that like, okay, I'll go back out there, right? And obviously if they close the deal, everybody makes money, but it's hard. And, and, and so many real estate companies now are like cloud-based, which is just code for we don't want an office because it's less expensive not to have it, but we need that. And, and I think just staying connected and literally picking up the phone and calling somebody and just saying, I love you, I appreciate you. It like changes them. It literally changes them. And then that butterfly effect of the showing they're gonna have with that other realtor, with the, it's like crazy. Um, so yeah, I've obsessed over that since day one in large part because the companies I worked for, pardon me, prior to me opening up Rogers healing associates, the people that got the most attention were the ones making the most money. And I never understood that. I never got it. And so one of my objectives when I started was we have no titles, literally every realtor is a realtor. All right. If they won an award, fantastic but we don't have like double silver platinum triangle producers we have realtors uh, but my goal was everyone is going to be treated the same there's no drama and we over communicate about everything 
And because of that, people feel safe and it doesn't change them. Um, and, and, and again, I've been humbled a bunch of times. I've, I've tried to, you know, do different things that hasn't worked out, but at the root of it, I just really try to create a place where people feel safe. They feel loved and they know that their leader is always working more than maybe not more, but harder than that. And that to me is, um, those are ingredients for success. Yeah. Love it. Powerful stuff, man. So just a, a one last question for you. I know we're going long on time here, but before that question, man, um, you know, we have a lot of real estate agents listening to this, this podcast. And if they want to continue to follow you, um, we have a lot of listeners that are in your market. Maybe they have an interest of, of learning more about your company, joining your company. Maybe they have a referral for your area and so Great. forth. What are the best places, brothers, to, to continue to follow you and to be able to get in touch with you? The internet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now we have multiple accounts. My name is unique. It's R O G E R S. Um, so you can, my personal Instagram is Rogers Healy. My realtor Instagram is Rogers Healy realtor. Um, one of our companies is at R H A D F W at Healy relocation at Healy property management, or you can just go to Rogers Um, so yeah, just whatever we can do to help. And, and, and part of our hustle on the relocation side of things is connecting realtors all across the world. So whether it's somebody that needs to have a client from Denver to Detroit or from Denver to Dubai, we do all of that and um, facilitate commissions as well. But yeah, um, whatever I can do to help, I, I, I love it. And um, there's always stuff that we can do better as well. So people that observe online or watch this and think that I could have said something better, tell me. Uh, I, I want to know. Yeah, no, love that, dude. And, and th cool. those that are watching, listen, wherever you're at, if you scroll right below, we'll have all of Roger's links, everything that he just uh, uh, mentioned to us. So that's just right below. So last question for you, Rogers. Um, you know, this might be, be tough uh, or, or a hard question to always answer, but knowing everything you know now, I mean, you've been in the industry for, like you mentioned, for over half your life now or about half your life. If uh, knowing everything you know today, if you could go back, if Rogers today could go have a conversation with your 21-year-old self when you first entered this business and give yourself two pieces of advice that you feel would have just fast-forwarded uh, fast this success trajectory that you're on, what would those two pieces of advice look like? Uh, study for the test. I'm just kidding. Um, num number one, just chill. Chill out take it easy, like the Eagles song, just take it easy and realize that no single deal is going to define you um, and that it's all going to be okay. And I, I think number two would be to always trust your gut, always. And no one ever looked back and said, man, I wish I wouldn't have trusted my gut. Just trust your gut. And if you get an ounce of that anxious feeling in your, in your, in your stomach, in your gut, don't do it. Um, and then my third piece of advice would be just to, just to smile and, and just to realize that, like I said, with number one, just chill out, but just smile. And people, people need love in real estate just as much as any other career, or maybe more. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Awesome Thank stuff, you. man. And, and Roger, Thank I know you. how extremely busy you are and, and the fact that you took time out to visit a beer, man, is my pleasure. A ton of fun and a massive honor, dude. Thank you. I'm going to take a screenshot real quick. So, um, yeah, look, look into the camera. Here we go. Got it. Thank you very uh, much. And boom. And those watching and listening, as, well. as always, we truly appreciate all your support. Keep up the amazing work, and we'll see you next time. Peace. See you, buddy. Bye bye. Hope you enjoyed this GSD Mode podcast episode. Now, make sure you get shit done and smash that subscribe button now.